So I'm very happy to have our keynote speaker here, uh, Richard Orbenden, the Baldwin Librarian from the University of Oxford and also highly involved in digital preservation as a president of the Digital Preservation Co uh, Coalition. And with this really interesting uh, topic presentation, which is sort of thought we're working and I'm sure we'll have a great, um, a great presentation. So thanks Richard for coming and sharing your thoughts with us, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to coming and, and talking to you today. Um, I'm naturally a, a, an organization like mine is very, um, has, has preservation really at the heart of our mission um, and has done for um, a number of years, probably about 700. And, um, and so what I'm going to be talking to you today is really a, a reflection on sort of recent events more globally and um, the way that I've been thinking about how um, these uh, moves and shifts in society in the way that digital information is being used or misused um, reflects on us and on our missions as libraries and archives and as memory institutions and what we might need to do in order to um, provide services to society more broadly um, uh, and perhaps more broadly than just serving the immediate needs of the academies in which most of us are, are based. So, um, you know, the idea of fake news and alternative facts has become very rapidly taken up in uh, popular culture. And the uh, inauguration of Donald Trump and the denials made by his um, team about the size or uh, otherwise of the crowd at his inauguration and the ability to use evidence to support the claims that actually he didn't have as many people attending his inauguration as um, Barack Obama had is, uh, I guess, a kind of neat encapsulation of what um, I'm going to be talking about. But of course, since then, um, it's become clear that there's been a great deal more than just um, the rather kind of um, crude uh, manipulation of uh, reality um, and it, it, its presentation. I think some of the um, news that has been emerging about the uh, manipulation of uh, campaigns, the manipulation of data feeds to um, Facebook timelines and Twitter feeds by um, the political campaigns and by organizations that sit behind those campaigns and the, the al algorithmic gaming of uh, political campaigning has begun to be a serious kind of political issue. And um, I'm an institution which holds one of these, which is one of the original 13th century engrossments of Magna Carta. And organizations like mine have held documents like this over periods of time in order to support the, the idea of civil society. So um, this particular copy of Magna Carta was consulted by um, William Blackstone, the legal, uh, one of the great legal thinkers of the 18th century, while he was writing um, his book on Magna Carta. And he was able to access it in the Bodleian Library. We'd had it uh, uh, at that point just for a couple of years, but we'd had several other copies that had been preserved. And of course, they'd been preserved before in institutional uh, collections in monastic libraries and monastic archives. But he was able to consult it because it was being preserved. There was a catalogue record for it. He was able to see it safely and securely, and he knew by citing it in his publication that other people would be able to go and check his findings by looking at the original. And his book on Magna Carta was then, um, you can find it in the library of Thomas Jefferson. And so it has an impact. It, it's spreading the idea of, um, you know, uh, 
the ideas that are encapsulated in this uh, political document are then spread uh, to other legal jurisdictions and the Id other ideas of government and democracy. And that's possible because libraries are preserving documents. So some of the work that's been done recently, I'd like to, if those of you who don't know um, the work of Jonathan Zitrain and Lawrence Lessig um, um, in their 2014 study in the Harvard Law Review, um, looking at the US, US Supreme Court website where they discovered um, that 50% of the links in that website were broken or some of the other work that's been done recently to look at the issue of link rot actually brings us back to this kind of fundamental issue that um, access to information is one of the pillars of an open society. Um, but it also it underpins, obviously, much of the core work that happens in, in universities. And so, uh, again, here's the, um, uh, the Zitrain, Albert and Lessig uh, article. So um, the idea that information that's being collected, the work of scholars should become uh, more broadly available is sort of, you know, we all, we all take that for granted. But the, the content explosion is making this more complicated uh, all the time. The, the volume of material that's available in digital form, the variety, the complexity of that um, material. And as we've been seeing in recent, more recent events, the vulnerability, the ephemeral nature of some of this uh, content explosion um, is making our job more complicated um, but more vital than ever before, and particularly that role of preservation. So here's a picture from uh, the shelves in my library. These books were placed there in 1609. Um, they're still accessible. You can find them in our catalogues as you've been able to find them in our catalogues for 400 years. And that's really kind of at the heart, just a repeat of our organization. And we've evolved the technical ways that we look after and preserve uh, print. This is our latest uh, equivalent of those shelves. That's what they look like now. This is our off-site storage facility in Swindon. We have about 10 million collection items there now. Um, and it's a very efficient and safe and secure way of storing that content. But in the digital preservation world, over the last, um, I would say, sort of 10 to 15 years, we've been through a process of kind of smelling the coffee about uh, digital content. We've become more aware of the, the risk of loss, more aware that we needed to do something, become more active. We've seen a whole series of reports and studies and projects that have been kind of groundbreaking and have kind of led to the growth of communities, communities of practice. We've seen the establishment of standards and we've seen sort of uh, projects which have helped us um, uh, move on. And I think we're now in a phase of, you know, drinking the coffee. We're actually um, doing sort of real stuff, real collaborative efforts, spending serious money on digital preservation in our communities, developing useful services, uh, tools. You're, you're very much involved in all of this uh, yourselves and we've begun to be better at organizing ourselves so um, the DPC, the OPF, we have Deepen in the US, um, in web archiving has become more sophisticated, there's been a more active and a vibrant community around that and of course most of us are, have been developing institutional repositories which serve some uh, preservation function uh, to some degree, um, more, some more so than others. And then we've begun to see also shared ventures like the Hattie Trust, where um, we are beginning to sort of pool together um, mass digitized resources. And sometimes I kind of reflect as people say, oh, we don't know, you know, we still don't really know how to do digital preservation. Um, well, I, I'm just kind of reflecting on our own catalogue. Um, so our catalogue in Oxford has been around now for kind of 30 odd years um, and we've migrated it from system to system in uh, ex libris systems at the moment. Um, 
And we've been able to kind of steward that data, which is actually a pretty big data set um, over, over long periods of time and may, continues to, to make it useful um, uh, over, over reasonably long periods of time. And also we've been digitizing collections at Oxford now for um, between 20 and 30 years on, on a reasonably large scale. And I'll come back to this um, later on in my presentation. And um, so we're, we're, we are, I think, getting much better technically at um, saving the kind of image, images. This is just a sort of pretty picture, but it's um, uh, emblematic of the, um, the image files that we've, as uh, an Oxford obviously is, is, is just part of a, uh, extraordinary effort to digitize collections, which has resulted in millions and millions of JPEGs and TIFFs being held by our organizations. And uh, I was reflecting on my own um, engagement with the digital preservation world, which goes back to the, the late 1990s and the CEDARS project, which I don't know if any of you um, remember it or were involved. Um, seems like a long, long time ago now. Um, and I thought I'd better refresh myself about um, details of what, what Cedars was like. Um, and unfortunately for a project that was about digital preservation, it's actually remarkably hard to find information about the Cedars project. Um, uh, and uh, all of the institutions that were involved in CEDARS um, don't seem to have actually anything pretty much uh, very, very, very available. Um, but thanks to the UK Web Archive, I was able to find some records of this important digital preservation project. Um, and of course, um, over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, as libraries, we've been um, migrating our, the content that we acquire and make available from print to digital and obviously the uh, electronic, the world of electronic journals and uh, uh, research outputs in article form has been evolving rapidly, uh, growing in quantity and we've developed some you know, excellent um, services, some excellent collaborative ventures like um, clocks and locks and portico to help us um, deal with the, um, the continued access, um, the long-term preservation and access issues around journal content. So we've kind of, you know, been focusing on, if you like, the 80%. If you think of the kind of 80-20 rule, for us in libraries, books and journals are the kind of 80%, um, I, would, I would argue. But I'd like to move on to some of the content sort of in the 20% bit to think about uh, and, and more to think about our kind of broader role for society, what it is that we are here to do. And um, libraries like mine have been collecting manuscripts and archives of individuals for a long time, um, going back to the foundation of, of, of our institution. And, um, Traditionally, these have come as, um, you know, they're basically the papers of famous people or prominent people, you know, academics, politicians, writers, artists, and we've tended to follow their hearses and have um, acquired their archives after they've died, basically. And um, by that stage, you know who's sort of, you've got a much better idea who's important, whose archives are worth keeping. Um, it's all in paper format. It comes, you sort of go and visit someone and there's a box of their loved ones' archives, boxes in an attic room or a study or in their garage. And you come and rescue it and you take it back to the library and you sort through it and you catalogue it and you stick it on the shelf. But of course, um, in the digital world, it's much harder to do that after they've died. You've really got to start talking to them while they're still alive um, because the actions that they're taking as they're creating their data make it much, much easier, indeed in many cases possible as opposed to impossible, to archive their digital equivalent of their correspondence, their exchanges with their colleagues, the drafts of their, um, their work, their, their letters, their communications with their constituents, and, and so on and so forth. 
So there's a great deal of um, the need to act much faster, much earlier in, if you like, the life cycle of the creation of this content than, than before. And we're also finding um, it, 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 the issues around the Intellectual Property and Freedom of Information Act, data protection, these kind of issues coming into play, where some of the communities that in my institution we've been used to working for, uh, working with, say, politicians, um, are much, much more nervous about their content because of things like FOI. And so we're finding that they're moving away, actually, from leaving records of their thoughts or their exchanges with their colleagues in electronic form for feel that it could be um, uh, made more publicly available. And going back to the telephone or, or writing in analog form where it's much, actually much harder to disclose that information. Um, and to some extent, we're still in the mode of dealing with the kind of legacy of digital material. Um, so this is actually the archive of a politician, uh, Barbara Castle, Baroness Castle, who was a Labour politician um, in the um, uh, post-war period. She left us about 200 boxes of paper and two word processors. And unfortunately, she didn't leave us the passwords to the word, word processors, so we had to hack into them. Um, but there was also kind of piles of, as you can see, um, uh, very old-fashioned storage media that have had to be dealt with. Um, and that, that, that sort of content adds to the kind of layers of complexity, the technical challenges, which are, um, I'm pleased to say, being solved. We've been involved with a couple of collaborative projects around personal digital collections. This one was called Paradigm, which um, we did jointly with the University of Manchester. We had a follow-on project called Future Arc. And uh, there are a number of other institutions which have been involved in this, in this kind of work. Um, but I do think that in terms of you know, going back to that core idea of preserving um, the records of individuals' thoughts, the decisions that they made, that much of this kind of personal information is at risk of loss. It's become, it's, it's already very um, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral, it's already losing its viability. And the spread of that content away from just their, if it was just on their PCs, it would be fine, but it's increasingly being stored in, um, in the cloud, in social media, um, you know, and we're beginning to find issues like sort of digital wills where people might die, but their descendants might not know that they've kept content in uh, Dropbox or Hotmail or Google Mail. And the processes of accessing that information, getting it out after someone has died, is, is already becoming uh, complicated. Um, just sort of reflecting on, on, on the web, you, I, I think, um, have some discussion in your program around web archives, and I um, have been very pleased to see this becoming a much more of a web mainstream activity, and I, again, reflect back to um, earlier in my career, sort of 20 years ago, with Cork. It's probably, anyone remember Cork? Um, uh, which was an, o uh, uh, an OCLC service for cataloging, cataloging websites, um, which now seems a, a dim and distant memory. Um, and the, the development of tools like the Internet Archives, Archive It service, have greatly um, facilitated this, uh, what I think is one of the kind of key uh, activities of the library sector, or should be, is uh, archiving, archiving the web and um, for, for fairly obvious reasons. And we've certainly been devoting increasing resources to um, archiving websites, both for, to continue our, if you, that, our historic mission of where our collections are particularly strong, where we, for a long period of time, have been collecting um, to do with geographic regions or individuals or topics. Um, but also in response to more immediate research needs where researchers are coming to us and saying, actually, we'd like you to um, preserve these websites so that we can 
um, have access to them and to have a verifiable copy that we can cite and point to in our, in our research outputs. And in the UK, we've been working collaboratively um, with um, in two particular initiatives, one which I'm sure you're aware of, the UK Web Archive, which is a curated uh, set of around 15,000 websites which originate in the UK. It's been led by the British Library, and we've been adding to that with um, legal deposit. So again, going back to the 80% um, of, if you like, traditional library materials, legal deposit in 2013 changed um, its legal framework to extend to digital publications. Um, but in addition to the kind of traditional publication formats, books and journals, we were able to add into the legislation the uh, legal archiving of the UK web domain. And that is happening on an annual basis now with whole domain crawls. Um, um, we began in 2014, we're currently underway with the 2017 crawl, and that's about six billion, that's an archive now of about six billion web, web pages. Um, and um, you can see the kind of numbers, and there's a kind of fundamental difference between the two. One is um, selected, highly curated, and um, one is um, mandated by law and is uh, a fairly kind of blunt instrument where the whole of the web is, is crawled, with the exception of uh, Deep Dive, uh, um, and I, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, but you'll, you can see that the accessibility of it, the UK Web Archive, this smaller, very smaller curated set is available on the open web, whereas at the moment legal, the Legal Deposit Archive um, is, uh, because of the, the peculiarities of the legislation of 2013, um, uh, are much less accessible and is not available currently on the open web. But you can see from this chart, my colleagues in the British Library have given me this slide, which shows the, um, the vulnerability of um, the, the UK web archive content and the, uh, the legal deposit web archive content. And you can see, um, as the time goes back, the, um, the fragility of material on the web and um, the, you know, the general kind of comments you still hear in society, well, it's all online, isn't it? So we don't, and I hear this from sort of very bright professors in my own university, um, that it's, it's all online, isn't it? I can find it. We don't need libraries to be doing this kind of work. Well, I think this chart um, shows you just how, how vulnerable the web is, certainly in this country. But it's also um, an interesting way of providing a kind of um, a, a historical resource. And I'm just going to show you a few slides from the history of the, li the Bodleian Library's own website, um, thanks to the, the Wayback Machine. So this is back in 1996. This is shortly after, sorry, 1997, um, shortly after we launched our website, which was the first library website in the UK. And then you can see how it's changed as an organ, you know, both the kind of the look and feel of it, the kind of degree of sophistication, but also the fact that we actually changed our name over that period of time. And that's something which um, many people, if it wasn't for services like this, will probably have forgotten about, or certainly historians in the future will be glad that we were taking a snapshot of our website as part of the institutional record. Um, and it also allows you to take um, archives of more, again, more ephemeral, smaller organisations, the Monster Raving Looney Party. I didn't sort of see them very prominently in the election um, uh, that's just happened. Um, but, you know, these smaller organisations tend to um, only actually leave a trace on the web now. They're, they're, they're not producing print materials um, in the way they might have done a century ago. But also the web has, uh, the UK web archive work that we've been doing under the legal deposit um, umbrella has given us the opportunity to do more collaborative um, work. This was a project we did um, in 2016 to commemorate the centenary of the Irish Easter Rising. 
and we did a collaborative project between Trinity Dublin, the British Library, and the Bodleian um, to archive websites that were um, reflecting back over the previous century, um, and uh, both in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland, where, incidentally, they do not yet have um, the legal framework to do web archiving, and that's something that our colleagues there are working on. So, just again, just to reflect back on what's happening at the moment, we have um, this kind of unique collaboration between six libraries um, in four countries with um, two uh, legal jurisdictions, um, and it's a process that goes back to 1610 when legal deposit first began, uh, actually in the Bodleian Library. Um, it changed its... Uh, its focus from being purely about print to being um, including digital in 2013. There are four preservation nodes for this content. Um, it is being funded and managed collaboratively across the six institutions um, through a thing called the Legal Deposit Implementation Group. Um, and we have a, a, a series of subgroups that are looking at um, you know, content acquisition issues, uh, very technical issues, metadata security, and some of the specialized uh, formats as well as we're moving into the archiving of uh, geospatial data online, um, digital sheet music, uh, emerging formats like enhanced ebooks. And this is a, um, uh, an image that we're using to kind of reflect the changes that the 2013 Act has, has meant towards um, the kind of work that we're doing. I'm gonna kind of skip over these um, mostly to give you some numbers. So just to give you a, a sense of the scale of the, the preservation tasks, um, we're working with Portigo to provide um, a data uh, normalized feed. Um, for, and so far we've ingested about 2.3 million journal articles. Um, so, and we're adding it at a, you know, just under 100,000 articles uh, every month and uh, direct from publishers, so some of the publishers that aren't coming, aren't contributing their data via Portico, uh, that's at around, uh, around 14 to 20,000 a month, and is about half a million so far. The number of e-books, the number of publishers who've transitioned their deposit from print to digital is much smaller, um, but that's still a significant number. So there's about 135,000 um, e-books that are now in the, the shared national collection. And we added about five, we're adding about 5,000 e-books a month um, into the legal deposit uh, collection. And so this kind of core aspect of library work in the UK and the Republic of Ireland, we've relied on that print deposit for 400 years now, and that is moving significantly into the electronic world and expanding its scope of content to include the web and other enhanced forms of digital information. Um, you've been talking a great deal this morning already in what I heard about research data, and that's obviously another part of um, the, um, the core work of, of, of all libraries now, certainly those in, um, in academic institutions. Um, and, and again, I think although it's, um, it, it's, it's something that we're all spending a lot of time um, trying to develop services and infrastructure to support, in some ways it's, it's not really anything new. Um, scholars were de depositing their data in our institutions in manual form. We have astronomic, astronomical um, surveys going back to the 17th century in my institution, and I'm, I'm sure many of you do too. But the funding mandates provided a big game changer in the UK. I think the EPSRC mandate certainly encouraged us to um, stand our research data repository up and to develop a, set, uh, a broad set of supporting services. Um, but the, one of the interesting things is that from the academics from the researchers perspective long-term preservation isn't high on their agenda it isn't something which at the moment that they that they feel is at the core of their service complying with research funder mandates definitely is making their data shareable 
or being able to link to their research data from their other research output certainly is. But the sense of that kind of long-term preservation is, is, I don't think, has really been something that the academic community has been uh, terribly concerned about. And I think that's something that does slightly worry me, and I think it's something that we all have a responsibility to do, is to go back to our researchers who are coming to us for research data services to point out to them the benefits of preservation. And I'm beginning to see some of this in the growing concerns over research ethics and the sense of the importance of verifiable research, uh, research data, being able to go and um, go back to scrutinize the, the underlying data that um, appears in many, um, uh, in many research projects. And, uh, you're beginning, I'm certainly beginning to notice this was something I just tore out of the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago with uh, the sense of um, uh, bad science. I don't know if any of you um, follow um, Ben Goldacre and his uh, Bad Farmer blog. Um, beginnings to be kind of signs that society as a whole has woken up to the sense that um, researchers, particularly in science and medicine, are making claims which are, don't necessarily map onto their findings in their data, and that there's been a number of cases of falsified data, and uh, this has encouraged this new topic of research ethics, um, part of which is about making sure that your data is available for others to check and verify and try to reproduce your results. And certainly that is beginning to be an issue in Oxford, in my institution, where there is uh, a community of practice which is very concerned about research ethics and services like our research data archive um, are beginning to be seen in a, in a, in a different light. And I was just um, interested, this comes from um, the cancer medicine community, which is about... Um, a slide which I found um, in their community uh, about research ethics and the, you know, the importance of, um, uh, you know, reproducible, replicatable research. But you don't see the word preservation in here. And I think sort of the bit that that community is forgetting is it actually needs institutions or organisations to guarantee access over the long term to the data which they are wanting very rightly to become open and, and uh, verifiable by all. And again, I think this is something that we need to do to educate our, our researchers. Um, I'm going to slightly speed up, I think. So one of the other things which continues to worry me, um, again, sort of perhaps in the 20% um, of, of our work is organizational records. And not only the org our own organization, so if you like, university archives, um, which are now being created more and more in electronic form, but the records of other organizations. And I guess this is similar to the issues that surround personal digital archives. But um, again, we have a growing range of organizations which are creating their own organizational records. Um, some of them see the business need to keep those for legal and evidential reasons, but they aren't yet seeing the long-term benefits of keeping data um, that they're creating to document their own organizational activities. Um, one of the examples that we're trying to do our little bit to change um, attitudes and change behavior is with the Oxfam archive. So again, I think, you know, in the last 40, 50 years, we've seen the growth of NGOs, the growth of uh, charitable bodies playing a much more active and much more vital role in public life. And their, their own archives can contain all sorts of actually very important and interesting information from a variety of perspectives. They contain scientific data. They contain um, uh, discussions at a political level or governmental level. They contain legal information. They contain the record of what is 
um, the behaviors of Western organizations in the third world. They contain in information that's important for environmental change, the study of environmental change. So um, Oxfam gave us their archive in 2014. It's a huge archive. Um, most of it is paper material. Um, the reason why we have it is that Oxfam as an organiza organization was founded in Oxford as the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief. Um, during the depths of World War II. Um, but it, it's such a huge archive. Um, it's, it's a huge archive, it's 10,000 boxes, but it's increasingly um, being created by the contemporary organization in electronic form. So um, as part of the paper archive came a number of plastic boxes. They were actually, uh, some of them were actually ice cream tubs, which no longer have the ice cream in them. But inside were CDs recording their, the, the evolution of their website. But we're also now taking the archive, um, which, which looks like this. And um, again, you can see the evolution of parts of the record. So you know, there are hundreds of thousands of photographs um, that, which they took or commissioned to document their own activities um, over the past 60 or 70 years, and they're, you know, absolutely fascinating social record, um, partly um, a record of their own organization, but partly a record of the society in which they grew and evolved. But again, those photographs are now deposited with, um, in uh, digital media like these. Um, and when you open those up, they contain pictures like that. So um, they're an interesting reflection on society. Some of the material in the Oxfam archive is um, you know, very relevant for their own organizational needs. Some of it is really very relevant for a wide variety of research uh, activities as well. And fundamentally, I think it's, um, it's part of the record of society. And again, it's up to institutions like ours to step up to the challenge to evolve and adapt the way that we're looking after those records as they change from analog to digital and to work with the organization as we're doing to make sure that as they continue to create their archive, which is in, in digital form, that we're working with them to make sure that we're not losing um, vital uh, information. I'd like to reflect for a few minutes on some of the other issues around the kind of breadth of communication towards social media and the rise of um, the continued inexorable, it seems, rise of social media organizations like Facebook. Um, and um, some, there, is some, there have been some very um, important efforts to try and deal with the archiving of social media. The Library of Congress famously established an arrangement with Twitter, which dealt with the first four years of their existence. Um, but there's no, currently no access provided to that uh, service at the Library of Congress. And it's all, certainly looking at their website, it's all gone pretty quiet, I hope. It, there's a lot going on um, under the hood, as it were. But currently, our, our Facebook do not keep their own records, and I'm not aware of any um, institutional library or archive that is doing systematic archiving of Facebook. But certainly, given the kind of information that we were hearing recently about um, Cambridge Analytica's um, uh, algorithmic manipulation of news feeds in Facebook, um, that worries me that we're not keeping that record or that you know, someone isn't keeping that information. And this slide is, is, is about to rather crudely convey another worry that I have, which is about all of the transactional data that is created and collected by the big uh, tech companies and which they actually trade um, your and my transactional data um, in um, data, uh, data trading exchanges. And it's the kind of data that has here generated in the advertising box um, uh, the fact that the Guardian website thinks I'm going to buy a BMW. I deliberately searched for BMW in order to um, uh, uh, provide my own fake transactional records because I, I have no intention of buying a BMW. But um, it's just to sort of give you a sense that there's mil billions of these transactional records are created every single day. Actually, if we were able 
as um, you know, public organizations to get hold of these or sample them, we would have a particularly interesting record of human behavior. And we might be able to tell, or data scientists in the future might be able to look at these if we were able to organize it um, to provide you know, an interesting view on what, um, what was going on in 2017. Um, but that's a, an enormous challenge, but it's not one that I think that anyone or any organization is really uh, getting a grip of at the moment. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're developing a growing sense of our own capabilities. We're developing, um, as I was saying in earlier slides, a kind of organizational context for doing digital preservation to a higher and higher standard. We now have these um, frameworks, uh, standards frameworks to work to. This is one, the data seal of approval, which my own organization is, is, is working with. And um, we've also tried to develop a greater sense of our own digital preservation issues by developing a project at the moment collaboratively with our colleagues at Cambridge University Library funded by the Polonsky Foundation, which has developed a cohort of digital preservation fellows. We currently have three in each institution, um, one each working on technical issues, one each on policy and planning, one each on outreach and training. And we are working collaboratively as a di distributive, distributed team across the two institutions um, who come together from, from time to time. And the, the overarching aim is to sort of um, improve our own capacity and knowledge about digital preservation in the two institutions. And to give you a kind of sense of the, some of the things that we've been doing, um, so we've been surveying our staff about their own um, knowledge of or interest in digital preservation to try and get a sense of, you know, we have two sort of big staff organisations. How much is the awareness of digital preservation down in, uh, across our colleagues? Um, but one of the fundamental bits of work we've been doing um, in recent months is a very, uh, what we hope is a comprehensive um, audit of um, digital preservation in our own um, organisation by looking at where we have content. And we've been looking at image content and um, it's been a kind of sobering lesson to find um, the scale of our collections the gap between what we've created and what is made available um, digitally, the variety of um, servers, storage locations, websites that that information is stored and made available from. And um, it's helping us as we begin to get this kind of sense of where all this stuff is, how much we've got, what file formats it, they are kept in, what management regimes that they're kept in to try and improve the way that we look after our collections, to try and improve our workflows. Um, part of that is about rationalizing the breadth of websites that we've created over, over the years. Um, partly it's about re-engineering re, re workflows. So that sense of being able to know ourselves, um, using the data seal of approval as a kind of framework for doing it, has been um, enormously valuable and um, I encourage you to kind of, you know, interact with our six fellows if you see them at conferences or meetings, follow them on their blog and um, please do um, interact with them via social media, that's uh, their website. I think we should also be aware that there is competition out there for services which we are currently providing, hoping to provide, aiming and planning to provide. And it worries me that again, within society, there is an equation between storage and preservation. And these are not the same things, as you all know. Um, but that's not um, to say that generally in society that is well understood. And I think, again, it's part of our responsibility to educate our user communities that these two things are different and, that the, and to create the kind of services that provide real 
preservation, real long-term trusted access. And part of that is about education. Um, we, from time to time, have hosted sort of uh, hackathons for very young coders to encourage um, this information, but we're all, all also beginning to in, um, including it in the training of our graduate students and undergraduates as well. Um, and then, of course, there are organizations like the OPF and the Digital Preservation Coalition, the organization I've been most um, involved with over the last um, 15 or uh, 16 years uh, as a board member and now as its uh, president. And ultimately, as we've evolved as library services over the past millennium, we've worked out how to keep paper, parchment and papyrus accessible over long periods of time. Th these are the newly renovated stacks of our special collections library. Um, and we need to provide the same level of um, care and attention and professionalism um, to the digital equivalent of those uh, storage environments. And fundamentally, also, I think some of what I've been trying to convey to you today is that it's about people, it's about the curatorial decisions, it's about the commitment to go and look for collections which um, both now and in the future will be seen as being vital for um, an, an open society. Um, I was an undergraduate at Durham and one of Durham's great figures was um, uh, a man called Martin Routh who was also had an Oxford uh, connection as the president of Magdalen College and um, he was once asked, um, uh, every studious man in the course of a long and thoughtful life has occasion to experience the special value of some axiom or precept. Would you mind giving me the benefit of such a word of advice, he was asked um, in the early 19th century. And he replied, I think, sir, since you care for the advice of an old man, I will find it very good practice always to verify your references. So I think that's kind of fundamentally what this preservation mission is about, is being able to keep in an age of fake news, alternative facts, um, uh, information in the public domain, in institutions that care about objective um, standards, about care about the objective long-term access to information so that it can be verified by others, so that individuals and institutions can be held to account for their actions, their comments and their statements so that we can understand society. And I think this long-term preservation role along with um, you know, the, an independent judiciary, freedom of the press and uh, democratic elections are the, actually the pillars of an open society. Um, and that's why we've been involved in archiving things like the leave.eu website. Um, um, we've archived images of the famous red battle bus with its um, spurious claims on the side of it so that those organizations that drove them around this country um, can be held to account. Um, and we've, this is one of the oldest books in my uh, library. It, dates from the 9th century. It's the oldest surviving um, uh, copy of Euclid's Elements of Geometry. And our aim, I think, as organizations would be to keep our digital content, the information I've just been uh, describing, for at least as long as we've kept um, our manuscript of Euclid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have the time for questions, but I think we think we last for a couple of hours, so I'm sure to ask them later on. And also, the people from um, digital preservation, um, people from, Co from Cambridge, are, we have two people here, the digital preservation team. I'm told these are Oxford people who weren't able to make it, but you'll be able to discuss with them. So again, thank you very much, Richard, for the very interesting um, talk. I think that you've articulated clearly some of the challenges we are having here that different people here in this room are having in their institutions, maybe on some of them on a different scale. And in this day, we will be able to um, hear maybe some of the solutions that some of the people here uh, have implemented in their own institutions. 
And on behalf of Moshex Libris and the Rosetta community, I really like to give you just a small present for a small for being with us.